if you don't accept yourself as a trans woman, you are placing a value on cis women over trans women. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Right. And so that's, I think, the basic problem is that, like, you are valuing something above yourself that you will never be. Yeah. So welcome. And you go by Natalie. Is that right? Natalie. Yeah. Okay. So I'm Alok or Dr. K. Thank you very much for coming Thanks. today. Um, nice to meet you. Yeah. I'm I really love your. So I here. think let's start. Sorry. I'm, I'm just fixing my camera which is why um, no problem. so uh do you want to just start because I, I i know you're predominantly on youtube or exclusively on youtube do you want to yeah. just tell us a little bit about who you are natalie and and what kind of work you do uh sure yeah my name is natalie Wynn. i am the creator of the youtube channel contra points and that is a channel i've been doing for about four years it's changed a lot over the time i've been doing it and it is, I would say, it's about politics, but it's also, I guess, more generally about internet culture. It's okay. more about the internet culture side of politics. So when I started on YouTube, I was kind of, well, there was a lot of um, creators who were doing what was called like anti-SJW content, uh, anti-social justice warrior content, ranting about these crazy blue-haired student activists who are destroying Western civilization. And a lot of my early content was aimed at trying to like introduce a more measured discourse around like social justice issues, progressive issues, because I felt that YouTube was a like, very, very right wing. Um, things have, the world has changed a lot in four years. The internet's changed a lot. YouTube's changed a lot. And I have changed a lot. Um, I am in a different, it's, like, it's a whole different website, a whole different world now. Um, you know, I'm now just one among a sea of people who's doing sort of what they call like left tube content now. And I also have, uh, you know, <laughs> changed genders in that time because I started, uh, you know, when I started in 2016, I was having like a kind of gender crisis. Um, but I shortly realized that I was a trans woman and I've been transitioning medically uh, and socially since 2017. And all of that's kind of factored into the content that I make on YouTube. Interesting. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. So like, I think uh, your videos are fantastic. And I don't know yeah. if you have um, experience teaching, but like, they're very well done. I think from a information dissemination standpoint, I think you're a phenomenal teacher. Thank you. I, um, I, before I did this, I was, a, I was, I was getting a PhD in philosophy and ah. dropped out, but, um, yeah, I did teach a couple of classes or at least take TAs in classes. That actually yeah. makes a lot of sense now that I think about it. Cause I, I think what I really appreciate <laughs> about your videos is, um, you know, whether you agree or disagree with the content, whatever, but I think from, a craftsmanship standpoint they're very thoughtful very logical i think you form a really good like sequence of explaining context and background before you know arriving at your thesis it doesn't surprise me at all that you formally studied philosophy because i think that's a you know they trained you how to think and construct an argument more than anything else um thank you yeah it turned out to be well and i knew like no one expects to get a philosophy job outside of academia but <laughs> i found the one thing where it Actually, well, I'm sure it's useful for, for a lot of things, but it's, it's surprised, very actually. specifically useful for this. Yeah. Um, in, in some fields like strategic consulting, they actually highly mm. prioritize or highly value philosophy degrees because training in philosophy is sometimes training in thinking. Yeah, it teaches you a certain approach to, to things like the ability to sort of understand a perspective that you disagree with mm -hmm. or to like build up arguments for an argument that you disagree with and then like sort of counter it. It's a kind of like, I guess I call it like intellectual empathy where mm -hmm. you understand like why you try to understand what exactly someone else thinks and why they think it. That's maybe yeah. the more psychological side is why. I was going to say that sounds like my job. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, definitely more psychology. So Natalie, I don't know how familiar you are with Healthy Gamer, but if I can just orient you to how we do interviews. Um, so, you know, I, we usually don't, we'll have guests who maybe like 
you know, prominent in a particular field, but we don't really talk about the work that they do. So it's not like yeah. a, you know, we're, we're really here to learn about people. Yeah, um, sure. And, and I think so uh, oftentimes I'll, I'll ask questions that are like personal. So like, I want to know about you as a person and your journey, as opposed mm -hmm. to any particular political views that you may believe in or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if, if a, a political view that you have relates to something personal in your life, I think that's actually like totally cool. Um, mm -hmm. But generally speaking, you know, we, we talk about people and I think a lot of what uh, our viewers really appreciate is um, seeing themselves in the person that they're talking to. So the, the discussions tend to be a little bit more personal. Sure. That being said, you know, if there is anything that um, you're welcome to draw whatever boundaries you want around the discussion. I'm not here to try to expose anything or anything like that. Um, <laughs> you know, like if there's something that you feel uncomfortable with, you're welcome to say, hey, I just don't want to answer that. Um, and then if I notice you're getting uncomfortable, I may actually point it out to you and then ask for permission to proceed. Okay, sounds good. I mean, I'm a habitual divulger of information about myself, so that's probably really? going to work out fine. What does yeah. that mean, a habitual divulger of information about yourself? Well, I, I, it means I enjoy the confession the confessional format. I, I, love, I mean, every once, every, every couple, you know, twice a year, maybe I make a video that's really more about me than about anything else. What do you enjoy about divulging information about yourself? Well, I, I suppose I'm, I'm interested in myself because I'm around this person all the time and sometimes I form opinions. I, I guess, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it feels, there's also maybe a kind of there's probably some kind of therapeutic thing for me. It feels good to sort of speak your truth, as it were. Yeah. I don't know. I, I can, it can also be sort of, I think it can be unhealthy to sometimes when you're kind. I, I don't know. If I, for instance, I find it easier sometimes to talk to a million people than to talk to one person. In that, I think, especially online, there's a kind of, when you're producing you know, I'm sure people can relate to this when you're posting anything on social media. There's a kind of illusion of, of, of solitude that comes from being alone at your computer um, are often, you know, alone in front of the camera, uh, which is often how I'm filming, right, and how I'm writing. And so I've I'm sort of gotten over this. I'm becoming more professional. But there, uh, there used to be a time when I would... Um, you know, the first time that I would see the video I had just spent a hundred hours making in the YouTube player itself, I would have this moment of panic, like, oh God, like other people can actually see this. <laughs> like, this is not just my private di video diary that I've been working on. Um, but I don't know, I guess it, it feels good to sort of like share what you're going through. And oftentimes, yeah, you know, a bunch of other people will find something relevant to themselves about what you shared and so that to me is very um well it, it often it makes you feel less alone you yeah, know when you certainly. hear that other people have been through this something similar and that's actually exactly what we're about we're about you know i, I think a lot of the it's the reason i started streaming was because what I noticed is I was having the same conversations like over and over and over again, and everyone thought that they were alone with their struggles. Yeah. And what it yeah, turns out I, is I, that everyone is struggling with the same stuff. It's just, that's not what we advertise, right? We, sh we put on a yeah. mask and we show people something else. And so everyone else gets the impression that the world is like a lot of people who are doing fantastic, whereas yeah, really totally. all of us are struggling. Yeah. Um, and so well, I think there's, a, there's yeah. like a leap of faith almost that happens when you put out something very personal because you're, you know, maybe everyone thinks you're crazy um, or maybe, and this is a leap of faith, the fact that you are going through something in private that's not often discussed, it's going to turn, it's going to turn out that, you know, 10,000 other people are going through that same thing. And they all connect with you. So, so you're sort of hoping, or even if they're not going through exactly what you're going through, it relates in some way to their own experience. And so you're hoping they connect on, on some level. Yeah. So can you share with us, is there, has there been a particular leap of faith that you've taken that's 
surprise you in terms of how people responded to it? Oh, let's see. Uh, yeah, there, there's been a few. Um, trying to think of a like the best example. Well, I did a video a long time ago on incels, the incel movement. And I kind of, in the last part of that video, related, because, you know, so I spend a lot of time on incel forums. Like, when I, part of what I do when I cover a, um, like, an intern, you know, some facet of internet culture is I will go into the forums and I'll, and I'll like sort of spend time learning the vocabulary and learning like what are the concerns, how, you know, what are the, what are the usual objections that people give to, you know, to incels that they've heard a hundred times and are just already don't want to hear, um, you know, and so I guess what I found is that like there is something kind of profoundly, I guess, relatable to me about the like obsessive, like self abuse that a lot of the, like incels have, right? This kind of putting themselves down all the time and to the point of like physiologically, like anatomically analyzing their defects in great detail. And that it reminded me, I guess, of um, a lot of like the uglier trans faces online, which in a different, you know, in a dis kind of different context involve exactly the same thing which is like an, a kind of an obsessively negative, self-harming, like analysis of your own anatomy, right? Mm. Uh, the black pill, right? The, 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 that's what incels call it, the idea that, you know, because of their, you know, inferior bone structure, that they are de doomed by nature to have a lonely life. And, that, yeah. Yeah, and, and so you said that, that you said it sort of resonated with you on, on some level or it was. I it did. Yeah. yeah. I found something familiar about it. Um, you know, right down it's to some weird, weirdly specific parallels, like a concern about the shapes of facial bones. <laughs> and can you, do you mind if I ask you a little bit more like mm -hmm. personally about what it was that resonated with you or what kinds of thoughts that you had about yourself? I'm assuming we're talking well, about thinking about yourself. Absolutely. I mean, at the time, I was actually considering going through like major facial surgery um, to change my appearance, which I ended up doing. Um, but it's it's funnily enough, it's actually a, a frequent topic on incel forums too, where they'll talk about basically doing all the opposite things of what I did. You know, <laughs> augmenting the jaw and to get a stronger, more masculine look and. Uh, you know, strengthening the brow bone and doing all these things that give them that like chiseled, chadly appearance. And and so what is it that, how does changing your physical appearance, how does that relate to the way that you perceive or feel or talk, talk to yourself? Like, how do you, like, you know, what, what help, what motivates you to do that? And what does it mean to you to do that? Well, I think it's something that most people do to some extent. Like, I think everyone has, everyone with a mirror has some kind of thing about themselves they don't like. I think that when you're trans, like I am, like there's an additional layer of it. Whereas, I mean, you like, I went through a period where like, I mean, I was presenting, appearing to the world as a, as a man. <laughs> and that's so, how, like, there's a very, that's a very drastic sense of what I'm seeing in the mirror is wrong. Mm. Um, and I think that, you know, I think that's not as, you know, it, it's, it's a complicated question, isn't it? Like how much of that dysphoria, gender dysphoria, how much of that is just what it means to be trans as part of who we are has to be respected. And how much of it is a kind of negative, like internalized hatred because society views trans people with a very cruel gaze. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not clear, like, what is gender dysphoria? And what is just me internalizing this kind of ugly way that people have of looking at trans people? So, Natalie, do you mind if I ask you some questions about, like, what your sense of, like, kind of where you grew up? I mean, not so much in terms of details about where, but, like, what up sure. your upbringing was like and, and how you learned that you were trans? 
Yeah, I can talk about that a little bit. I mean, I had, um, I guess, as, a, as an early in my early childhood, I had a pretty a pretty normal boyhood in a way. Like it's actually, I actually don't like pre twelve years old. I actually look back on that time mostly with with positivity. Hmm. I think that you know, I I was sort of neither the most, I was certainly not the most masculine boy, but I was not, I was not feminine to the point where it was a major problem. Um, but when I was a teenager, I guess I sort of began, there, there was this like discontent beginning to stir hmm. the sense that something was wrong. Um, in my 20s, it just got worse and worse. Can you and, explain uh, that feeling? Um. Like, how would it make yeah, her? I'm just imagining that there's like yeah. someone who's 19 who's watching right now. And how would they know, you know? Yeah, how would you know you're trans? Well, it's a question I get a lot. Um, well, it gets, a lot of trans people will tell you that it's, it's easy. Like, oh, if you're even questioning it all, that means you're trans. I don't agree with that. I think that a lot of people question their gender for a lot of reasons. Um, and I think that, you know, w whether you're raised as a boy or as a girl, like there's a lot of like gendered expectations put onto you. There's a lot of, um, you know, there's a kind of image of, of you know, what, the, what you're supposed to be doing, a script that you're mm -hmm. supposed to be following. And it's, it's everyone to some extent, I think, questions that a little bit about themselves. Like, I don't think this, that may be especially true of, of, of women, people who are raised girls. Like, that's a very constrict, well, it's, it's, I think it's true of men in a different way, but it's, um, you know, th there's it, oftentimes like going to be situations where, you know, even if you are just a, a you know, a regular cis woman, like you're going to think like, this sucks. I don't like being treated like a woman because it sucks. Right. <laughs> right. And there's times when it, when, you know, when it, it sucks to be a man, like it's it, absolutely, it does. Um, but so to me, it's a question of, of figuring out, like, not just whether you're responding to those things, but in my case, it's more a question of, you know, I just don't, I feel like socially, I sort of fit a script for women better. Hmm. Um, and physically, I'm, I have this kind of, this sense of alienation from my body that is making it hard for me to like it's it's you i feel i felt I sort of feel like i had to be detached from my body or go outside of my body i didn't feel sort of physically connected to the world and i you know I, people who are like trans women who are sort of like not aware that they're trans yet tend to do a lot of things that they can't quite explain to themselves like like an atypical for a for man amount of body shaving and uh, or that, that kind of thing just kind of trying to have a more androgynous look i guess was something that i'd been doing for a long time and then you know i i would kind of like as a joke you know it's halloween well what if i what if i was a girl well, isn't that funny <laughs> what if you know um and, and that kind of thing and at some point you know you you realize that like it took me a long time, honestly. I, there was a lot of denial and excuse making, but I think you know YouTube in some ways helped me helped me figure it out as I was kind of presenting. Uh, you know, at the time I was it was played off as like a bit where I was like going to be like a degenerate cross dresser. That was just the 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 shtick. But so it looks uh, like you used a lot of humor and and yeah, and, uh... yeah, which is um. It's kind of what you, because you, I, I was sort of aware that like, you know, like I, I knew that I didn't look like a woman. Like I, I looked like a man in a dress and people think that's the thing that people find funny. So I guess my way of coping with that was to be like, well, I guess it is kind of funny. Let's make it funny. And so I did that. But at some point I kind of realized like, this actually is not funny to me. <laughs> it's like, like, this is what I want to be. And I don't want, you know, I actually... I, I feel like I'd rather live as a woman. Um, and that, you know, there was, when, I, when I realized that, there was a kind of period where I was going back and forth and being like, no, that's because of insanity, don't do that. And then times when I was being like, okay, but it's what I want. And 
you know, through, through laborious, through stages. Like for a while, I gen- identified as like gender queer, meaning that I sort of identify with neither gender. Mm-hmm. I thought of myself as just like an androgynous person. And so I, w- I would wear, you know, I was, I was like very ambiguous looking, like I'd be wearing nail polish and lipstick, but like still being a, like socially, like being a man, I guess, mm. uh, using a male name and things, but just being a, a sort of, of, I don't know, flamboyant or um, uh, how? What is the word I'm looking for? Like uh, adorned man. But I guess um, you know, I just at a certain point I realized that I wanted to. There was like a medical component to this. You know, I, I felt that I was. Uh, well, I felt that like it, it was a problem not to. It's a certain point. It's not just about oh, I painted my nails. Oh, lots of men paint their nails. That's fine, right? Oh, I wore a dress. So I love, well, men wear dresses all the time. Like, but at a certain point, I was like, but like this is like this is not what I want to be. I don't want to be a man in a dress. I'm I I I think I'm supposed to be a woman, and uh, that then you know I, I it was always it was all very gradual I kind of stumbled into it like some people I don't know the different trans people have different stories some trans people that they know from the age of three they just have this strong inner conviction they're different gender that's not really my story to me it was it was more just like a series of like gender problems and gender confusion that so, just kind of s- settled on this Natalie how how has your internal experience or how have your feelings changed or your thoughts changed as you've walked along that journey so i'm imagining i'm trying to envision like when you were 16 years old and you looked in the mirror like how did you feel about yourself and what did you think about yourself um well i think when i was very young like that i kind of like found a way of expressing these feelings through like just being a pretty boy, you know? And like, I was like, well, that's fine. Like, that's kind of me, you know? Um, and it, but, but I guess that's really got hard. I think one thing that happened is when I got a bit older, like that occupying like that kind of role, you know, at some point, like, can you be a 40 year old pretty boy? Like, I don't know, maybe, maybe you can. Like, I'm sure, I'm sure that there's, there's, there's Hollywood actors and stuff out there who I would describe that way, but I, I guess I kind of realized, like, you know, being a boy was okay, but being a man wasn't, mm. if that makes sense. Sure. Sure. And, I mean, I, I think, you know, boys and girls and men and women, I think there's more, um, you know, androgyny between boys and girls. You know? Exactly. Exactly. So. And so I, that's kind of how I see myself. Like, as I can perceive myself kind of becoming a man, that really like just trigger the sense of dread and feeling of wrongness like no like i'm not supposed to be that mm. um and so i i think that i also around this time like you know i was not raised with a with a knowledge of trans people not in any detail um certainly not in a very positive um so, you know what did sense. you dread about being a man i guess i sort of felt like I felt that it wasn't an expression of myself, and that's very. I know that's that's kind of vague. That I feel like I'm not making it clear. It's a kind of feeling that's hard to put into words. It's like I just. I would just look at at women and and see like like that's what I should be doing. You know, mm. like I I sort of it, it's a matter of. Um, at a certain point, kind of like identification, like I think that most people got, get their idea of what it means to be a man or what it means to be a woman from other men and women. Like you sort of form role models, I guess. You have like sort of, a ver- I mean, trans people and, and cis people are, are, are similar in a lot of ways. Like, like we all, you know, have some ver- way version of our gender that's like we feel like that's us you know and obviously there's a lot of different ways of being a man there's a lot of different ways of being a woman but um i guess you know uh, and, and i think when you're an adolescent especially you're kind of experimenting with different options like you might sort of try to be six different people between mm. ages 13 and 18 that's pretty common but um, 
like what happens when you start admiring the you start seeing yourself in in women and not in men that's, that's a great way to put it me. yeah um so i i guess what you identify with or what you strive to be or the kinds of role models you have happen mm -hmm. to be not from your gender yeah and yeah it reminds me of you know people say um when i was in med school and trying to figure out what i wanted to do um what people told me was like you know don't worry about the field like think about the kinds of doctors that feel like role models to you yeah yeah you know and and so I'm kind of curious, you know, go, going through surgery, um, I'm trying to find the right word for it. I, I feel like drastic is a little bit judgmental. So I'm trying to steer clear mm -hmm. of that word. But, um, it, you know, let, let's put it this way. It's it's a big step, right? So medically it, I transitioning. Mean, yeah, like uh, dr drastic is not entirely wrong. I, mean, I, I know I have like a little bit of a negative connotation of yep. like take things too far, but I, I it is... Um, it's a significant decision to make, um, especially like, you know, the, the, the main surgery I've had is facial feminization, which is a terrifying surgery. Like you're changing your face, which is a very personal um, thing, you know. Um, I think, and there was a lot of fear about that going into it. I thought like, am I, am I going to lose myself? Like, am I going to not look like me anymore? Um, and what happened? Well, as it turns out, I, I basically just love it. <laughs> I, feel, I, feel, I feel like I look more like myself now than I did before. Interesting. Um, in my case, it was it was a, a, the right decision. Um, I, 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 but it's uh, it's certainly not something to do lightly. I think it's uh, you should, it's good to spend a few years, honestly, thinking about it before you're doing it, um, because it's. Uh, yeah, it's an ordeal. It's an ordeal to go through. It's a lot of pain and difficulty and expense to put yourself through. Um, but I think, like, to me, I mean, especially as someone who's on camera all the time, like, it really was a preoccupation that I had with, like, you know, especially once I knew that, knew that what was possible, I was like, I, I want, this is something I need for myself. Yeah, so let me ask you something. So I, you know, I probably am a little bit disrespectful towards incels more so than I, I should be. Um, mm. And but I, I sometimes kind of struggle a little bit with like that balance of changing yourself because yeah. there's a part of me and I think this like sort of doesn't internally make sense to me. There's a part of me that says that, you know, it's completely fine if you want to change your body, but something within me recoils from the idea if I was talking to an incel. And they said, you know, I want a more masculine jawline or I want this kind of facial surgery to make me look more Chad-like. And I'm, I'm really yeah. not trying to make fun of them now. Sometimes I do that and I probably shouldn't. It's um, hard not to because they do say some ridiculous things that are very misogynistic and, things. And, yeah. and so I'm just trying to understand, like, you know, is that the same or yeah, is that well, different? I think it's a it's a complicated question. Like, uh, you, you know, there's there's incels who are talking about plastic surgery who are fixated on plastic surgery within feminism. There's there's discourse about like, is this just women trying to meet like oftentimes like racist and patriarchal expectations about what a female beauty, um, instead of just learning to love themselves as they are. Um, so I would say like, what, you know, I think that even an incel or, 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 you know, cis woman like has a, a right, has a right to get plastic surgery as well. Of course, I think that these like the desire comes from a different place though, in a different, um, there's a different kind of justification for it. Like, I think what, like, I think what's kind of like aching us out about incel plastic surgery is that oftentimes the explanations they give for why they're doing it are based on things that are kind of false and deranged. Like the notion that you need this certain jawline for women to be attracted to you and that's going to fix everything. Like that, that, that's, that doesn't make sense. And it's mm. probably not true. And it's, um, it, it just comes from a fundamentally misguided like idea of like, I mean, it, and, and again, I don't want to say it's always the wrong thing to do. Like maybe you have an incredibly weak chin and you just genuinely do look a lot better with a stronger jawline and that's going to make you happy. Like maybe so, maybe so, but maybe not. And I've seen a lot of people posting on incel forums where it's like 
there's patently nothing wrong with your face. And they and they've but they've kind of scapegoated this. They say this is my physical appearance, like that's why I'm lonely. Like that's the problem I have with women. Like if I change this, like everything's gonna be fixed. And that is delusional thinking. Because I don't think having a stronger jawline is gonna suddenly make you you know, women magnetize. The, I mean, honestly, that's so my experience with the incels and part of the reason that I make fun of incels is that I find yeah. that when I talk to a person, I have trouble. I've been looking for what I call a true incel for a long time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and what what my experience has been is that anytime you talk to a person who identifies as an incel, if you I the more I talk to them, the more that I get to know them, I can't find an incel in there. You know, I, yeah. I, what what I see is just relatively regular level of insecurity or you know concern about their appearance or, or things like that. Um, but it's you know it's interesting. I I just wonder a little bit about some of these because you were sort of mentioning like feminist communities that sort of talk about a particular body type that is essentially the result of the patriarchy. And I'm wondering actually if the converse is true, and that's what the incels feel. That there is sort of this. I mean, it sounds actually like the same argument, where it's like there's a feminine standard of beauty, um, yeah, and and that people are being judged and aligning towards that. And I never thought that feminists and incels would be making the same argument, but yeah. bis- bizarrely. Um, well, I think um, I, I think that I guess the incels tend when we talk about surgery, they tend not to be super critical of it. Like they feel that there's this male standard of beauty. Um, but oftentimes, instead of attributing that to, say, like patriarchy, this like social circumstance that could be changed, they attribute it to like evolution, hmm. the nature of the dating market, and the nature of like the com- you know competitive mating and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, or they seem to think that the female brain is just wired to like this kind of draw, you know. Whereas I think that the feminist critique is more is founded in, in the idea that like oh this is all socially constructed. Um, now, I think that with trans surgery, um, it's kind of complicated because there's kind of a little bit of, of, of two different things going on. One is like gender dysphoria. There's a person's individual internal sense often totally against what a person has been raised to think they should be, right? Like I was raised to think I should be a man. Why am I not doing that? Like, because there's something individually about me that is like rejected the script I was handed. Um, and so I think that like part of the reason for my wanting to have surgery was really just to my personal desire to see myself as I feel I should be, even against society to wanting me to look like that. However, when you start, you know, I live as a woman and people judge me as a woman and they judge my appearance as they would judge a woman's appearance a lot of the time with some complicating factors because of the fact that people know that I'm trans. Um, but I, I think that... I, it's a question I definitely struggled with when I was, you know, preparing to get surgery. Is like, who am I doing this for exactly? Like, am I doing this because this is me? Is this is going to make me happy? Like, this is what I want to see in the mirror. Like, this is all for me. Or am I doing it because I think it's going to make me look more socially acceptable? I'm going to be more desirable to other people, more um, easily able to assimilate into other, you know, into society. That's, and you, yeah, that, that's and the answer is both. Yeah, it's it's interesting because there's there's actually I really love that you mentioned that because it's like where does the desire to change come from? Yeah, does it come from wanting something from other people, right? Mm-hmm. So if I'm let's say like I want a stronger jawline to attract more women, that mm-hmm. doesn't feel that feels to me like it's a desire to change yourself to accommodate or have something to do with the outside world. Whereas what I'm it's all about from, other people and what they yeah. want. Yeah, and, yeah. and what I'm hearing from you is that like the fundamental difference is like, I mean, not to say that you don't want something from the outside world as well, but that there's a difference between wanting to be satisfied with the way that you look for your own sake, as opposed to wanting to look a particular way for other people and to get yeah. something from other people. Absolutely. Like, I think that for incels, this is all... They don't particularly seem to care about looking in the mirror and seeing this, whatever their flaw to jaw, whatever it is, except that they think that this is holding them back socially or sexually. And like, if they could just fix this part of their anatomy, then 
you know, this would be a means to the end of, of attracting women. And so, Natalie, as you transitioned, um, how were you judged? What's that been like for you? Um, well, it's not easy to, especially online, like people view, I mean, people online are just, are just horrible in general, are pretty horrible in general. They can be anyway, they can also be amazing, but, but there's a lot of like judgment and negative judgment. I think women get scrutinized very, very heavily based on their appearance. And then trans women in particular, I find attract a certain, like, like not from everyone, but there's a subset of people who are sort of have this cruel obsession with trans people and sort of analyzing them and deconstructing them and and just picking us apart. And that's something that I've experienced a lot. And I would be lying if I had if I said it didn't get to me. Can you can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah. Well, people, when you know, you will see. Sometimes it's YouTube comments. Sometimes it's you know responses to your tweets or comments on Instagram, they'll have to say these things for me. It mostly isn't that. It's mostly what this, it goes on like in a secluded part of the internet. You know, there used to be a, a Reddit a subreddit called gender critical, which is which is like ostensibly like a trans exclusionary radical feminist way of thinking, but which often kind of Wait, what does that mean? So there's a there's a there's a faction of radical feminists who are like vehemently opposed to trans people because they view trans women, they basically don't think that being a trans person is legitimate. They view trans women as men who are kind of impinging on female space, sort of invaders. Interesting. And they, yeah. And they, it sounds and like they, gender appropriation. Yeah, that's often an argument they'll make. And then they view trans men as like, as like our lost damaged sisters who just are just internally misogynistic and trying to be men to escape. Um, but like oftentimes- wow, people will just judge other people for all kinds of stuff. Oh yeah. <laughs> people, but it often will just devolve into like simple, like, and like a roasting basically. And you know, it's not, it's not just them. It's not just these people. There's, there's a lot of people on the internet who, who enjoy this. If you ever go to, you know, 4chan, God help you. Like there, there's people, there's parts of that website where they sort of will obsess over trans people. And it's like, it's especially yeah. bad if you're, yeah. There's a lot of criticisms to be made for 4chan, but oddly enough, and, and hopefully I'm not speaking out of turn, I was really surprised recently. So I, I you know, sometimes I work with people with autism and it yeah. seems like it's actually a pretty supportive place. It's, it's for people with autism. It's kind of strange. It's a complicated website. Um, I mean, there's parts of it that um, that are like are, are pretty pleasant. There's 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 parts of it that have even like kind of like fostered some of the good parts of the internet. And people will you know anonymously without any expectation of thanks or reward, um, like do very nice things for each other. Yeah. I've absolutely seen those things happen on 4chan. But then it can also devolve, and it sort of depends on which you know, uh, which form you're in. But it can devolve into just, and just incredible nastiness and cruelty, also. Yeah. And I think that especially that that t tends to be a thing that happens with with, with uh, trans people. So I don't know. It's not. It's, it's been a common experience that I'll run across. I've gotten better at just avoiding this kind of thing. But you run across a forum wherever it is, where people are just like. You know, they're posting pictures of you or videos of you, and they're just like tearing you apart, like your physical appearance. They're misgendering me. They're 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 dead naming me. They're saying like, you know, oh look at his giant shoulders. Look at his like like. Will anyone ever believe that's a real female voice? Like, of course not. And like like this kind of, it's just. Uh, it's very mean, or they call you a sexual pervert and say that you're just narcissistic and but it's. Uh, so a lot of it, it's, it's very like cruel, I guess. And, and how does that, I mean, yeah. how, what's it like to be on the receiving end of that? Well, you feel like a, um, like a butterfly pinned to a board or like a, a vivid section in a way. It's, it's very, it, um, it hurts. It does. And like, and a lot, of, you know, I think of myself as a very th thick skinned person, like, I have a person who's been arguing on the internet for four four plus years professionally. I am acquainted with negative comments and negative feedback. But I feel like this style of thing in particular 
it has really hurt my self-image and it has kind of caused me to become like preoccupied with my appearance in a way that I think if I were not online, I never would have cared this much. And in a way that I feel that sometimes is, is pathological. What, what kind of preoccupations? Well, I, I feel, um, I feel like I have to be very prepared to go on camera. I, I, when I look at myself in the, um, you know, I'll glance over here and look at my, um, the, my own monitor basically. And I'm just sort of analyzing it. I imagine the things that people are going to say about me. And I guess what happens is you sort of internalize this very negative way of looking at you. And the worst part is then you, you begin just applying it to yourself and maybe worse still, applying it to other trans people. What does that mean, applying it to yourself? Well, you sort of look at yourself with the own, with the same judgmental, mean kind of gaze that other people look at you. So, so I, I find myself, and if this is too personal, please let me know, mm -hmm. Natalie, but I find myself like wanting to know the actual thoughts that go through your head um that when when you see like when it, and i would imagine that that actually your criticalness of your appearance fluctuates first yeah. thing i would say i would hypothesize and i'm curious about you know when it's more active what are the actual thoughts that you have about yourself like what thoughts mm -hmm. kind of thoughts go through your mind well, I will, I will sort of, I mean, if I'm filming a video, for example, I'll be looking over in the monitor and I'll think like, you, I look like such a transsexual and I'll say, well, you are a transsexual, you idiot. Of course you look like one. And then, and I'll, you know, I'll listen to recordings of my voice and be like, oh God, like that does not sound good. And, you know, it sounds like a fake voice. It sounds like I'm trying too hard it's, uh, or I will, um, like I can't watch like my old videos. I can't watch videos from two, two years ago where I was sort of like not as good at this as I am now. And, and those and, are just horribly painful. And when you say horribly painful, so I, I'm I'm gonna share something with you. Oh, well, let me just start off with this. So I, I I'm noticing there's actually two things. One is your reaction, and the second is your reaction to your reaction. And I think yeah. a lot of toxicity that people struggle with in terms of the way they view themselves actually comes from that second part, right? One is like, so just to kind of repeat back to you, and this is why I'm asking. So I want to try to illustrate this point for other people too, that you look at yourself and you say, oh, I look like such a transsexual. And then <laughs> sometimes people, you know, clip what I say. <laughs> out context. <laughs> I always think about that too. And I yeah. just realized like this is gonna be like, it's gonna be, yeah. it's gonna be, it's gonna be great. Um, so you know, you 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 say to yourself, "Oh, I look like such a transsexual," and then actually, I think right. that's actually okay it, to me. Uh, uh -huh. But I think the really damaging thing that we do to ourselves is we um, we say, "Of course you do." You're a fucking yeah. transsexual, right? Yes. <laughs> and, and and so like the, the funny thing is that you can respond to that initial observation in two ways, which is like, yeah, this is just, you know, I'm I'm never going to look like a perfect woman because, yeah. you know, somewhere in there, there's a Y chromosome and that's okay, right? Like yeah. I can learn to be like, I can be accepting that I'm not going to look a particular way or whatever. But, but I, I think when we really get into those dark places, it's like you can make an observation, which is fair, right? And then like, but then it's like the thing that we tell ourselves after the observation, that's really damaging. Yeah. And what I find is that people try to fix that first thought, which is they like try yeah. to convince themselves that when I look in the mirror, you know, I don't want to look like, whereas like, I think that's actually missing <laughs> yeah. the point, which is that it's, yeah. it's okay to look like that. Like, yeah. you know? No, I agree that, like, I think that something I sort of, I think that's an area I've begun to improve, improve a little bit recently is to, is to say, like, oh, like, yes, I like being a transsexual. Well, good. Being a transsexual is good. And it's fine. It's like, you're allowed to be a trans woman. Like, you're allowed to, it's, it's allowed. It's, it's an okay thing to be. And if you look like one, okay, you are one, and that's not bad. Like, I, I think that's, like, the more, the more healthy response. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes, sometimes I'm like feeling that sometimes I'm able to get to that, that point of confidence where I'm like, 
well, yeah, but, and, and like, that's fine. And like, that's not something to be ashamed of. Um, and then sometimes I slide back into the, like, the negativity about it. Yeah, yeah. So, so in, in a weird way, you say, and that's fine. That's not something to be ashamed of. I think like there's even one other layer of compassion here, which is that if you're ashamed of it, it's okay to be ashamed of it. Yeah, accepting the shame and like, yep. I guess not blaming myself for it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Right. So like, like it's okay to be ashamed about your appearance. Like it's almost like saying like, yeah. okay, I, I get where you're coming from. Cool, man. Like don't right, beat right. yourself up about it. Um, and yeah. I use man as a gender neutral term, which I knew, oh, yeah, yeah. know is going to get me in trouble at some point. And I, I try to catch myself, but it doesn't bother me. Um, so can you, can you tell me, Natalie, and, and once again, if we, you know, touch, how are we doing so far? Am I asking you questions that feel hurtful or personal? No, no, this is good. Okay. This is good. I, I think it's actually really helpful because I, I like hearing your actual thoughts because I think that's yeah. something that we all do, whether you're trans or cis or whatever, we all judge ourselves and then yeah. oftentimes beat ourselves up for our own judgment. And the wildest one I heard recently, which is so common, is just really hurts me sometimes to hear that when people make progress, instead of being happy about it, they beat themselves up for not making progress sooner. <sighs> yeah. It's one of the strangest phenomenon, but like, instead of like moving forward in life, as you start to move forward, you start beating yourself up more and you kind of say like, oh, I, why didn't I do this when I was 20 or it, it's really strange anyway. Oh, it's well, that's definitely how I feel about transitioning. Like there's a, I think this is very common. There's a lot of regret for like, why didn't I do this earlier? Like it would have been easier when I was earlier. I would have missed out on less time. And like, it's, uh, you know, I, I really started taking hormones when I was 28. So that's on the later side, um, you know, and I feel like, oh, it would have been, if I'd done this when I was 19, uh, this would have been so much easier. I would have had a better result. Like uh, I, I would have wasted mm -hmm. less time in this like gender limbo that I spent a lot of my twenties in. But I don't know. It is like it's it's just what I had to do. It's just what I had to go through to realize this to get to where I am. So uh, I try not to like to dwell on the regret too much. And like it could be worse. Like you know, I I did get it. I got it in my twenties, and like you know, things have gone pretty well for me considering. So. It's not that not necessarily something to complain about, but it is often, a, you know, it's a kind of background regret. Yeah. Why not complain about it? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's fine to complain about it. I guess sometimes it also accompanies a, a kind of, I think, I think among trans people, envy is so common. Like, it's, it's one of the things I feel makes my community of trans people sort of difficult for me to be around is that I feel like there's be you know we're all sort of under the same pressures and so there's this like like girls who look amazing and who kind of pass easily as women and and just you know are kind of thriving in that way are like often intensely resented by people who haven't made that and the other side of this is that oftentimes like the people who are you know trans women who are are, are super passable super pretty super whatever like they, they can be very contemptuous of people who aren't. And I find myself often like in both of those mindsets at various times um, where, you know, so, sometimes I, I will look at the other, the trans women in particular on YouTube who thrive. And a lot of these people are people who transitioned at, you know, 16, 17, 18, and now they're 22 and they're gorgeous and they're perfect. And I'm just like, oh God, like, like why am I even allowed to be on camera around these people? Um, and then other times, like, you know, I think I will kind of, well, there's a terrible part of psychology, human psychology where the sort of abuse of things that are said about you, there's a sick pleasure in reiterating those things at someone else. And I like, um, I, I'm sorry to say that I'm not a buff, at least in my head, doing that to other trans women. Yeah. I, I think sometimes, sometimes we forget that hatred is born of hurt mm. in, in my overwhelming experience. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, not, not that this is a conversation about incels, but I think that's just another example of a community where most yeah. of these people that I, that I talk to, it's usually like there's some hurtful experience that happens to them. And yeah. then they start to hate the thing that hurt them, which unfortunately is part of being human. 
Um, yeah. And and what what do you? I mean, what is it? So it sounds like you're aware that you experience envy, and you sort of also have some mean thoughts. What's that Lord, like for yeah. you? To like see someone who's like 16 and has transitioned, and and I'm imagining it's, a miss the boat sort of kind of feelings that can. It's a very miss the boat feeling. Like it's there's this there's this this intense like regret and longing and envy to have gotten what I miss. You know what I mean? I, th I think that there's definitely an element of that. Um, and I, uh, you know, I try not to dwell on it because I know it's, it's totally unproductive. I cannot go back in time. Like, uh, you know, it is much better to look forward and, and be grateful for what I do have and accept it. But it, it is also, you know, it's hard to entirely put it out of your mind. Yeah. So oddly enough, um, Natalie, I'd, I'd play devil's advocate there for a second. Yeah. And I think part of the reason that those feelings linger is because you may not be dwelling on them enough, right? So yeah. like, like, I think that this is a really challenging tightrope to walk, but the balance between emotional processing and like wallowing in regret. Whereas, like, yeah. you know, I, I hear this thing a lot and it sounds really positive. And I think generally speaking, it is. But it's not true peace, right? So if you say like, oh, like you look at that person and you have thoughts of like, you know, envy and you have thoughts of regret and then you kind of say, well, I should be grateful because at least I did it in my 20s and, and yeah. you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have done X, Y, Z and maybe I don't live in, you know, a country that's less accepting of trans people. Mm -hmm. and, and so what happens is you take that negativity and you like, like push it down with positivity. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, totally. And that that's adaptive, but I think what I've seen is that like then the negativity keeps cropping up, right? And and ultimately what you want to do is is actually like accept that, you know, mourn, right? It, it, as opposed to regret and, and or even just accept that regret and accept that this is your I, I'm gonna toss out a word karma or karma. Like this is just your path in your life. And it's not gonna be perfect. Um but it got to be careful because I think a lot of times we try to squash negativity with positivity, especially if we're like, you know, pretty um, decent human beings, for lack of a better term. I've heard um, I mean, I've heard this term like toxic positivity thrown around to describe this like sort of refusal to engage with the negative mm -hmm. to the point where it becomes like almost damaging. And, or, or becomes damaging. Yeah, I was going to say not um, almost. Not almost, yeah, it becomes damaging. And yeah, I do think that especially like, because I have a, I have, I'm very conscious of the fact that like I can in tell. the grand scheme of things, like I am lucky and privileged beyond most trans people. And there's a, with that, there's a sense of like, I have no entitlement to this petty, regretful, like moping, you know? Because I'm so lucky to have what I have, but it is true that it, 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 it that, that does Wait, lead are, me to are, not. Are you? That sounds to me like toxic positivity. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Maybe so. Because because I I think let me let me like if I can just share something with you, Natalie. Like so. Yeah. I think this is a really common problem. I mean, I think it's a problem. People disagree with me. So I I think that like no amount of privilege or luck right. it excuses suffering right like so yeah. like like Buddha and I think he was right about this sort of said that like human beings suffer it's like part of what we do and no matter how much you have we suffer and somewhere along the way like we started blaming people who are privileged for suffering and I'm not saying that like people who are privileged shouldn't appreciate it right so and this is really tricky because people sort of say like if I express suffering and I have some kind of privilege that I'm being ungrateful or, you know, you, you tell yourself that, that like, I'm, I'm entitled, but I think you're yeah. allowed to suffer. And I think if you have privilege, you should use that privilege for the betterment of the world, but your individual suffering, like no amount of privilege. And we can see this because, you know, you can see a lot of people who are very successful and have a lot of money and things like that, who are clearly like distraught and bent out of shape and things like that. Celebrities and, and, you know, yeah, the, political I, candidates figures. They're, they're, they're told there is this sense that like once you make it to a certain level, like 
well, you've lost your right to complain. <laughs> like, or, or, or you cannot possibly be suffering unless there's something sort of wrong with you, right? Like if, you're, if, you, if you have money and you have success and you're not happy, well, like you're ungrateful, you're spoiled, you're not aware yeah. of your privilege. And if you could just be aware of how lucky you are, then you would be happy. Um, but yeah, I, f- I found that not to be the case at all. I mean, the last year, like, this has been one of the hardest years of my life, to be, to be honest. What's and it's hard? also, uh, oh, well, a lot of things. Um, but, but, one, but certainly not a lack of, like, you know, c- career success. Like, I'm, I mean, this is, I'm at the peak of this. I've never, you know, I'm, I'm, do- I'm doing financially very well. Like, I'm doing, a, the, the views are just pouring. Thank you. <laughs> the views are just pouring in. Like, I, I can count on a million views per video, which is, like, it's wild. It's like it's, it's a lot of views, but most people are, are on, on this web on this platform are longing to get that money. And it's like I don't think I ever would have believed four years ago that having what I have now wouldn't have made me happier. It would just be unimaginable to think that all having all these things I wanted, if getting them wouldn't really make me happier. But it doesn't. And it's like it's it's hard to like. I don't know if I can convince anyone of that. I feel like it's something you almost have to see for yourself. Um, and because I, because it's not like no one ever told me this. Like it's almost like platitudinous that like money doesn't buy happiness. Like we all say these things, but then when you when you, you you don't really believe them until you live them. And yeah. that's like that's kind of where I'm at. So so mm, so many different places to go. So I'm going to give you three options that I'd love to talk about. Let me know if any feel okay to you. One is sure. I'm a little bit curious about um, what you think and feel when you watch older videos of yourself. Mm. The reason I feel like that's important is because I, I hope, Natalie, that you can actually just be at peace with where you are. And I think the way to really get there is by confronting, you know, what you've stuffed down about the way that you look at yourself or the way that you think about yourself. That's yeah. one. Second thing, um, which maybe is a little bit more philosophical, is to think a little bit about, you know, where does happiness come from, right? So we do have these plat, you know, these like platitudes. Um, is that pl- platitude? That doesn't feel like is that the right word? Right. Okay. Um, about you know, money doesn't buy happiness and sort of this idea. So then like, where does happiness come from? And what can we understand about the nature of happiness? And the third thing that I find myself being curious about is you said that the last year hasn't been easy. And I'm, I'm curious about what's been challenging for you because it sounds like from a professional standpoint, you're doing really well. You've quote unquote made it. Um, and, and so what do you, what do you think? Any of those kind of resonate with you or that? No, no, I I think they're all pretty good. Uh, I think, I think, uh, yeah, we'll start with, um, sorry, what was the first one? The first one was like, what do you see when, what do you think of, what do you think or what happens in your mind when you look at older videos of yourself? Oh yeah. So I just can't stand it. Like, because I see someone, you know, at a much earlier stage of transition and like a lot of things are wrong is what I'm seeing. Like I'm seeing like, uh, you know, like, oh God, like I didn't know how to do makeup properly. It looks terrible. I, what am I wearing? Like what kind of cringy, not understanding how to dress yourself as a woman thing is this? Like what I, I hear my voice, which at the time is much worse than it is now. I mean, when I was, you know, if you go way back, I had like a much deeper, much more masculine voice. And then there's also a lot of just deeply awkward stages along the way where my voice, I'm trying to, I'm trying to sound more feminine, to sound more womanly. I'm not succeeding. That's my impression of it. It it sounds like strained and and false, you know? And it's like, there's already this like, this like, such like negativity around trans women being like men trying to be women or men acting like women that to like go back and see myself basically as that is very painful. You what know? hurts about it? Well, it's, a, I guess it's, I'm at a point where I think of myself like, 
I don't think of myself as a man trying to be a woman. I think of myself as a woman with a male past. Um, and so to see myself like as almost this like caricature of what I don't want to be, of what people like, I like to think what people mistakenly think trans people are. And I'm like literally seeing myself as that. Like, it's like, ah, it just hurts because I see, I sort of take the gaze that people maybe see all trans people as. And I literally am seeing myself that way. So, Interesting. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is that like when you look at yourself from a couple of years ago, yeah, you see the negative stereotype of a trans yeah. woman. Exactly. You are the embodiment of what yes. people negatively. You're like you're you're uh, you're the embodiment of the negative representation of a trans woman. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Have you ever seen this subreddit called Blunder Years? No. So it's 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 like a great place where people post like pictures of themselves, like usually during teenage years or things like that. And yeah, and you know, I guess it's a play on wonder years, but like the blunder years, like yeah. before you got to be where you are, you know, when you were transitioning. Um, you know, it's interesting because when I hear you talk about yourself, the, the closest thing that I can think of is actually like thinking about puberty yeah. and just how awkward I puberty is. I think that I think it has a lot of parallels to pu puberty. I mean, sometimes people in the trans, you know, trans world we call it like second adolescence, meaning that it's like a, a period where similarly your body is changing, your identity is changing, yep. your social world is changing, and so in a lot of ways, you act like a teenager acts, and you make mistakes that teenagers make. But I feel with this additional layer of being undignified by an older person doing it. And, you know, an older person who should know better, we think, right? And, like... That's the um, second part, by yeah, the way. Just, yeah. just sorry to interrupt, but, like, <laughs> you know, so, like, you set a standard, like, so, like, you're allowed to blunder. Yeah. It, it's, it's when you say that you should know better. Like, you're not allowing yourself to go through a second puberty, you know? With all that entails, including the awkwardness and the yeah. regrettable yearbook pictures, <laughs> right? Yeah. No, I think that's true. I think that, like, I think that would help me a lot more if I could reach a point of compassion of seeing this as, like, an awkward, like, sort of pseudo-adolescent period. Um, I guess, what is the obstacle to that? Well, part of it is that most people don't transition, right? So there's not, like, a widespread cultural awareness and, like, relatability to, like, because everyone, everyone can relate to looking back at your, like, 16 year old yearbook and being like oh god right because i think most people kind of do but but it's much harder to relate to like i don't know looking back at you at age 28 in your early transition stage making all these terrible faux pas and like and just like not having it together yeah so i i can see what you're saying about you know not having it relate to the common experience yeah. um but in my experience, and there's a but there, right? So, uh, Natalie, yeah. that I, I think that relating to a common mis experience is a common mistake about, like, growth. Because I, I think, actually, the more you look at your own growth, you, it sounds to me like you've grown immensely. And I think most of the growth that you've gone through has nothing to do with the common experience. In fact, it has been in spite of and separate from the common experience, which is your point exactly. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that if you can grow so much without sharing this, like, you know, a common experience with other people, that common experience is not a necessity for growth. And in, in my experience, it's actually like personal introspection that is the real answer, right? Like I can procrastinate and the rest of the world can procrastinate and I can feel validated and connected to other people because we all procrastinate, but ultimately my journey against procrastination is one that I have to walk irrespective of what everyone else is doing. And so, you know, what I'm hearing is like, I, I just think that you've really got to think about why you judge yourself so harshly. Right. And where does that come from? When did that start? Well, I think it's a product of being judged harshly by other people, like especially during those times when, like, like I said, people are people don't pull any punches; they're very mean, like online, and like when you put yourself out there, especially on video, like 
there's not a lot of restraint that people have in terms of saying what they think about you. And so I feel like it's these series of experiences of like humiliation, I guess, and were, shaming. Yeah. Were you, do you remember any experiences of like pretty strong humiliation or shame, like even before the age of 18? Like even before you started to dabble in this kind of stuff? Um, well, I, uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I can, um, I mean, I can remember like I, yeah, I was, I was, when I was, you know, early teenage years, I had like, you know, a girlfriend for whatever that meant at the time, you know, for two years and sorry, not two, for two months. Um, and like, I remember like one of her reasons, like for breaking up with me was this sense of like, why can't you be normal? Like, why, why are you wearing your hair like that? Why are you such, why are you such a framing little like <laughs> sissy, you know, like, and, and so there, there was a sense of shame about that. There was a period where like, I did try to be like more of like a normal man. Um, I think that when I was, when I was like around in my early twenties, especially, I was like, I was giving it a real try. Um, so I think, all, I think that like the, the first part of the shame was the shame about being like, I mean, at the time, like, you know, a, a male identified person or male, I'm just functioning as a man in society, but with this like sense of that it was wrong for me and this longing to do something else, but a thing that like, you're very strongly discouraged from doing as a man, right? So I, I think that like, there's a kind of like identity fracture at some point in here, because now obviously I don't apply the standards of manhood to myself, but there was a time when I actually did. And I felt that, you know, so there, there was this kind of shame around that. Um, and then when I transitioned, you know, that involved overcoming that shame to, to, to sort of put myself out there as like, no, I'm actually a different person than you think I am. And like, it's a, it's a shameful thing that is not except socially acceptable, but like here, here it is. Um, so there was like this moment, I guess, of triumph then about of having overcome a kind of shame. But I feel that it was replaced in a way with an almost a whole new world of shame where it's like, you're, you know, you go from shame from not being a good enough man to not being a good enough woman um, as people so, start judging you by different standards. Yeah. So, so Natalie, this may be, you know, a touch academic and, and, mm -hmm. you know, I'd say that if you're interested, I don't know if you, you see a therapist or, you know, have anyone that you can kind of co confide or work through things. But if you don't, I think this is a great kind of thing to work through with someone, but, um, and maybe you already have. But I think that you got to be really careful there. So my understanding of, of the mind comes primarily from like yogic theory and like Eastern conceptions of mind. And I think that essentially what happens is you've got like this ball of shame, which just changed clothing. And the tricky yeah. thing there, and I think this is why things don't get better is because, so it totally makes sense that if people are toxic towards you on the internet, like that's going to leave a mark and that's going to change the way that you talk to yourself. Completely agree. Yeah. Actually, after hearing your story, I think that there is the, the real red herring here is that you did triumph, but that there was a piece of it that was left over and like changed clothing and then started yeah. to be like, but that toxicity actually lingered. And I suspect that it actually started way before your transition. I think I think yeah. it started with the way that you started to talk to yourself as these trans feelings like so your lack of acceptance for who you are doesn't come from YouTube. I mean, I know that YouTube comments can be really impactful for people, but I think you've been carrying that with you for a long time. No, I think you're right about that. I, I think that, you know, I'm thinking back. So I transitioned in 2017. That's when I started medically transitioning. But like there was an earlier period where I considered it back in, it must have been 2014. And that, you know, I was living in Chicago at the time. I was kind of experimenting with dressing more androgynously. I would go out with nail polish and like, you know, makeup on. And I, I was I was sort of moving this direction that, that is like sort of difficult of someone who's like moving towards a gender transition. But I can remember having experiences of like, seeing other trans women who looked like me 
like out in public, like on the subway and having this strong reaction of like, ew, no, oh God, no, I can't be that. I do not want to be that. I can't look like that. This is not acceptable. And then like that shame causing me to like nail polish gone, makeup gone, get it together. Like we can't, I can't be that, you know, which is like a really ugly thing to think about someone else, right? Which a horrible thing to think about another trans woman, but it was not based, it was, it was, it was, it was like sort of discussed with myself in another person in a way. Absolutely. It was, yeah, it was seeing like, oh God, people are going to see me the way they see her. And like, I can't, I can't handle that. So I know this sounds bizarre, Natalie, but I, I jotted down, I, I've been taking very few notes, but one of the things huh. that I jotted down is I wrote down the word someone. And it's so interesting because when I actually asked you, what do you think when you look at videos of yourself from a couple of years ago. It's the first time I heard you use the third person talking about yourself. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like a tiny thing. And then you switched into first person, but like, it was a strange way because like, it's almost like, you know, the thoughts that you, the thoughts that come up when you look at old videos from yourself sound to me exactly like the thoughts that came up when you saw someone who was transitioning. Absolutely. It's absolutely that. It's like, it's like I'm seeing like this shameful thing I see in others, I see in myself. So I, it's almost like I don't know which came first. Was it me being sort of judgmental and transphobic towards other people? Or was it being judgmental and transphobic towards myself? It's I don't not, know. Which so comes first. Natalie, this is a, I'm going to take a shot in the dark. It's not yeah. transphobia towards other people, it's actually envy. I think at the yeah. root of this is your envy for the ugly person. How so? Because I think that like you saw those people and you saw them doing something that you thought was ugly. And I think deep down you wanted to do it too. Sure. Yeah. And, and so I think there's more there than transphobia. There's more there than revulsion. There's, I think, as you mentioned, right? Like, like I think there's envy wrapped up in that. That, like, I don't have the courage to be the ugly person that maybe I should be. I don't have the courage yeah. to be ugly. Yeah, I'm afraid. I, no, it is, it is that. It's like, I, I, it is a kind of, I guess, cowardice. Like, I can't, especially at yep. the time, like, it was like, I cannot handle the life this person is living. Yep. Right? So, so, so um, I think yeah. th that self-judgment doesn't come... I mean, so I think, you know, if you look at the internet, the internet is going to call you many things, Natalie, but coward is not going to be one of them. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> right? So that sense of cowardice doesn't come from the outside. It comes from you. It comes from your own judgment about not doing this thing. And that's like regret is rolled into that too. Yeah. Right? Like, what do you regret that you weren't what? You weren't courageous. You yeah, didn't do it earlier. Didn't do it earlier, yeah. Right? And then you judge yourself for, like, not being courageous. Whereas, like, I mean, you know, I don't mean this to be demeaning, but I think you were, like, you, like, literally went through, like, a second puberty, right? You went through yeah. a coming of age. You went through, I mean, you're a late bloomer. And sure, I think this yeah. is something that uh, I think a lot of our community, like on Twitch and gamers and whatnot, like people who watch YouTube, like we hold ourselves to a certain standard of time, like life is a race and then we're falling behind. And it's very biased towards like very young people yep. because that's who's represented on these platforms. Yeah. And, and we kind of look at all these people and, and we like look at ourselves and we say like, oh, I'm behind. And it's like, I, I don't know how to stress this to you, Natalie, but because I think you understand this stuff. I think the interesting thing about, thing about the way the mind works is that you activate, your mind activates certain programming, which is not the Natalie that I'm talking to. It's like a Natalie from a couple of years ago. Like these feelings are old. They're not like current feelings. It's kind of weird. Yeah. But, you know, it's like, it's just like, like opening up an old picture of yourself, like looking at an old picture, like that picture retains the age at which it was taken. Even though you mm -hmm. can grow and change, you have these things in your mind that are like relics of your past. And when those things activate, you know, I think there's a lot of envy towards people who are more courageous. I think there's a lot of lack of acceptance 
towards yourself, which we kind of have been talking about. But I, I think what you've really got to think about or what I would you know, encourage you to read about or think about is just to really recognize that like you were supposed to be quote unquote ugly. Don't even steer clear of that. Right. Mm -hmm. That was just that's just what happens in puberty. Like people start getting acne and their voice yeah. cracks and like it's just an awkward time. That's part of your journey. And I yeah. think what keeps you from being happy today, and now we can maybe transition to happiness, but is that like ultimately, you know, success and stuff is fantastic. I, I don't think that that doesn't contribute to your happiness. It's just that you're carrying these things from the past. And as long as you, you know, view yourself as a coward, as long as you, because um, you're very self-aware, incredibly insightful, incredibly insightful, and very aware of your internal process. You're really gifted in that way. And, and um, I, I mean, I think you have to be to transition, right? Like you've got to really dig in there and see like, oh, wow, this gender is not what I feel like as a person. Um, but I, I think it, until you sort of work on that stuff, I, I, I think happiness is going to be around the corner, unfortunately, which doesn't mean that you can't enjoy mm -hmm. things and you can't be happy, but that old hurt you're going to carry with you. Yeah, I think, well, I guess it's the thought of it. I had a thought before that, like, if I could be, if I could find, like, some kind of love for the person that I'm, like, so urgently feel, feeling I need to distance myself from, um, then I think it would, I think I would have a more peaceful mind um, because it is kind of a burden to feel, I mean, especially because, like, as a YouTuber, like, like I'm never gonna, to me, it feels like a ball and chain. Like my own past feels like a ball and chain that I'm dragging around because I made the, what, what I think is like ridiculous decision to, to, to transition with the camera on. And it's like, oh, why did I do that? Why, did, why would I put myself in this position now where I'm sort of, because online it's like time. It's, it's like- Frozen. People, it's frozen, yes. It's like it's like like people perceive you as this like four dimensional like like uh, you know ever present person where the past is just as immediate as the present because they can just you know you can watch my video from three years ago and there it is right on your screen you're gonna hear my voice you see my face it's like that person is there still um, so so yeah Natalie I have a pseudo meditative exercise for you which I think could be. Uh, challenging and painful but i think could help yeah. you a lot you want to okay. give it a go sure okay so this is what i'm going to ask you to do okay i'm going to walk you through it and then you're allowed to say hey i actually don't want to do that okay? okay so so here's so when you look at pictures of yourself or videos of yourself you know you react a particular way totally fine you know you think certain things about yourself and you sort of externalize them, like you sort of turn it into, but you think certain things about yourself. I can't believe I was like that, whatever. So that's a very selfish way of thinking, right? Because when you look at yourself, you're thinking like, oh, I'm so dumb. By, by selfish, or maybe self-centered or self-focused is a better way to think about it. All of your thoughts are about you. And that can be hard to develop compassion when you're just kind of thinking about you. So what I like to try to do, I've never really done this before, but hopefully it'll work. Maybe it'll help. Maybe it'll be a complete train wreck is I want you to, when, as you watch that video, what I want you to do is first of all, notice those things, right? And notice that those are thoughts about yourself or maybe someone else is a little bit clear. But then I want you to ask yourself one question as you watch that person. And that is, or maybe you can just tell us, not so much about what that person is doing right or wrong, but what does that person need? Mm -hmm. Right? What is, were you calling yourself Natalie back then? Yeah, yeah. Right? So, like, think about, like, what did that person, like, need more than anything else in the world? Like, what is that person's experience of life in that moment? You know, and, and really try to, like, put yourself back in those shoes instead of judging it. Try to be empathetic. And just, like, what, like, as you look at that, that image of yourself, and you guys can do this to anyone who's watching, right? If you regret something or you judge yourself, to, like, go back and, and try to think about, you know, if you could go back in time and actually have a conversation with that person from three years ago, what would you say to them? 
And if the hypothetical is enough, we can talk about it. Otherwise, I would encourage you to actually pull up an image of yourself and look yeah. at it and watch what happens. Well, I think like on the top of my head, without even looking, I mean, I, I feel that what I just needed was like, I just needed time. Like I needed time to make those mistakes and time to like work on the things that needed to be work on, worked on. And like, you know, I, I know it's going to, things are going to be okay now, but it's like, and at the time I just needed the, I just needed the experience to to learn how to how to sort of become a more comfortable uh self that's not this kind of like person who's sort of straining to be what i couldn't yet be right so so like if i were to tell you natalie i'm gonna try to pretend to be you from three years ago and i'm gonna say yeah I'm trying this stuff out and I feel really, really dumb about myself because when I look at myself in the mirror, I'm ugly. Yeah. I don't know who I am, but I know it's not this. What would you say? Uh, well, I'd say, look, like, first of all, like, you're not that ugly. <laughs> like... It's really not worth worrying about it, but like also more to the point, like, you know, I understand that you're not happy with who you are and you're trying to be someone else, but like the way this works is you, you have to, you can't try to become someone else. You have to learn how to become, you have to learn how to express yourself. And I know sometimes it feels like okay, but I'm transitioning. So shouldn't I be trying to get away from, you know, this thing that I used to be that I don't want to be? And it's like, in a sense, that's true. But also I think that, you know, doing it by forcing it is sort of, I don't know, uh, it's making things worse <laughs> than it would be if you had a more relaxed attitude towards this. And like, weren't trying to sort of rush it so much. Because in some I, ways I thought, yeah. But if I had started earlier, like I went through like a male puberty. Yeah. And so because of the testosterone, like my jaw is bigger now, I've developed all these secondary characteristics. Like, hmm. I, I mean, you're telling me that I shouldn't force it, but like, I'm telling you that I should have forced it a long time ago. Not so. Well, because if I started this process earlier, like I wouldn't be in this situation. I wouldn't be awkward now. Yeah. Well, that's also true that I, you know, if I had, if I had done this, you know, earlier then I could have sort of gotten myself together faster and I wouldn't have such a long period of, of like past that I feel is like an alienated from. So great. So I don't know if you noticed, but that's exactly what you should do. So I think we just flipped. I think we hit the barrier. I don't know if Twitch chat is going to understand this. Maybe it's just all in my head. So like, I think you did a fantastic job of talking to yourself. The message that you sent to yourself is exactly what you should be thinking. And, and yeah. right? Like, I just go back and like, watch this later. But like, that's not what you say to yourself, but it's exactly what you need, need to hear. And it's exactly how you need to talk to yourself, which is not dismissing the negativity. It's just saying, hey, this takes time and you're going to have to figure it out and it's going to be a bumpy ride. Yeah. Right. That's what you told yourself. But those aren't the thoughts that you actually have when you look at a picture. But now what I want you to do is the next time you look at a picture of yourself from a couple of years ago, see those two conflicts, right? Just like your philosophy degree, where you take the other side and you try to sit in it. Now you've got both sides of the argument and just swim in those waters. I don't know how else to put it to you, Natalie. Just swim in that space. I have faith that given your degree of self-understanding, given your analytical capability, and given your earnestness, for lack of a better term, if you just give your mind and your brain the opportunity to swim around in th those thoughts and feelings, you're going to come out fine. And then what happened is I asked you about the regret, and then you had trouble talking to yourself in the right way. Right? So like, then you started like 
going back to your standard thought pattern. I don't know if that makes sense, but I've never yeah, heard I, you talk about the old you in the way that you did during this exercise. Um, but I think we hit the border of kind of where your exploration is and like where your compassion is and where your empathy is. Does that make sense to y'all? Like, I don't, I don't know. But anyway, does that make sense to you? I th Well, I think in a sense, yeah, because it's like the more compassionate, I guess, I guess response is like I was doing my best at the time. Now, maybe that's not good enough by my standard now, but False. it's like. Stop. Okay. Time out. <laughs> so, so now you're intellectualizing. That's not what you were doing earlier, right? Now yeah. you can, because you're fucking smart, Natalie. So you can come up with logically what the right answer is. But logically, yeah. the right answer is not actually empathy or compassion. Yeah. The way that you were talking to yourself was not a logical conclusion about what this person needs to hear. It's an empathic connection. It's like a fuck. I know what it's like to be there. And, and yeah. friend, you just need time, right? It's not the, yeah. it's absolutely the right answer, but it's coming from once again, like, you know, it's not coming from the outside. It's coming from within. And so I don't care about what compassionately, what you should say to yourself. Right. Cause you can't say that to yourself yet, but yeah. you, I think you clearly, I mean, at least to me, you've made progress today. I don't know if that makes sense, but sorry. I think it's, I think, no, I think it's, I mean, honestly, like, I think a lot of this has been like more helpful than a lot of actual therapy I've been to. Like, I think, that, <laughs> I, like, like, I, I mean, I think you're doing good. But I think that, um, uh, like we've, I think we've zeroed in pretty quickly on some things that are like the major problems. Um, I will say like, I guess that another, I guess maybe something that, that holds me back somewhat is like, because of the public nature of this, even if I feel that even if I can sort of form a kind of compassion for that past self, I sort of feel the way that I was judged at the time. And there's this fear that I'm going to be continuously judged now for the way I was then because of this, this like 4D, like, you know, time yeah, but, eternity that we have. But Natalie. Okay. So now I'm going to talk logically and I'm going to express a little bit of frustration, but I'm not frustrated okay. at you. I'm frustrated with the part of you that does this to yourself. So okay. the reason that you're afraid that the rest of the world will judge you that way is because you judge yourself that way. Uh, well, I do, but, but also other people do. Yeah, absolutely. Right. But yeah. like, the thing is, is that like, I don't know how else to say this, but if it's, if you're on the same team with the toxicity of the internet, you're going to fucking lose. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, you that need to be on that, your yeah. team. They can say yeah. whatever the fuck they want to. Yeah. But the cool thing is just like if Natalie three years ago had you as a sister supporting her, she would be in a completely different place. Yeah. And I can tell you that your ability to stand against the toxicity of the internet is going to be transformed if you can stand with yourself. Yeah. You're damn right. You're right because you're fucking smart and that's half your problem. That they will continue to hate on you. The question is, do you want to join them? Well, that is the problem, isn't it? Because like, because I feel that so many times I have essentially joined in yes. with those people. Like I take their voice into my own head and it becomes like part of me and it becomes my own perspective. Yeah, so I think you've got to be careful yeah. a little bit about where you're giving credit. You said you take their voice into your own head, which you do. But yeah. you had that voice before they did. That's, That's true, yeah. Right? So be careful That's there. That's true, yeah. And so if we're thinking about your agency and empowering you, it starts with the acceptance that this voice is not sure. They reinforced it. They fanned the flames. They threw fertilizer on it. Like, call it whatever you want to. I'm not saying that that's positive. But I think you have way more power of, in the way that you look at yourself than the internet does. Yeah. Well, that's that should be true. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I guess it, it is technically true because, the, the, you know, the, there's a limit to how powerful the internet can be in, in affecting me. But... Uh, yeah, it's like, that's a question is like, how, how where I'm going to find that compassion? Because um, I, 
I sort of had an awareness for a long time that like this is this this is something that's missing. It's, it's something that I feel like if I could if I could find this, if I could create this, I would be much stronger and I would have a lot more fun online, frankly, yep. because yeah. all this all this awfulness coming directed at me, I mean, could be sort of just brushed off as this sort of amusing, r- ridiculous nonsense that it is. Um, the like the weird hate obsession that other people have is that that, that is simply not my problem, right? Um, it's, it's a question of like how, I just can't seem to quite get to the point where I genuinely don't care, and when where there's not still this part of me that's on their side. Yep. So so well said. Okay. So like here's your quote unquote answer. So the first thing is that you did it today. I'm pretty sure I heard compassion come out of you that was not there before. And mm-hmm. I think it's the way that, and so I'd say is just go back and like evoke those feelings and then just ask yourself, pretend that you're, o- you're your own older sister. Yeah. Right. And like, how would you talk to your, you know, how would you talk to that person who's stuck in time? Now you're sort of lucky because like that person is still preserved. Right. So you can like actually kind of go back in time and like talk to them. I think that literally yeah. that exercise towards yourself so like i'd say like another thing you can do is imagine that time that you had you know nail polish on and like you went and you saw someone on the subway who was like one of these ugly transsexuals yeah and and just like you know just just walk yourself through and like listen to the way that you thought about your like you you thought about that person try to explore that feeling and then like talk to yourself now Right. And, and that gets more complicated. That's the barrier, by the way, we, we hit that barrier and you can see it. If you go, once again, go back and watch the VOD, there's the, there was a new thinking. And then I saw the old thinking kind of crop up. Um, yeah. And so you just got to, I mean, you got to work at it. Right. So I'd say like, just, just learn how to talk to yourself. So you're going to, you're going to figure out, you know, level one, you can talk to yourself from three years ago, level two, maybe five years ago. You just have to practice. The second thing, oh fuck, something else. Oh, yeah. The second thing is that I think just in general, the more that you can accept that you were a toxic asshole Mm -hmm. and the more that you can accept that just like all the other toxic assholes on the Internet, your toxicity actually comes from hurt. It doesn't come from you being a bad person. And the more because right now what happens is you judge yourself for being the asshole, right? You're like, oh, I used to be bad like that, and I try not to and stuff like that. What I want you to do is is follow that, pull on that thread back to its source hurt. And once you find that source hurt, then you can express compassion towards it. I think the reason you can't be compassionate towards yourself is because I don't think you've tracked back to the actual wound. Mm. So follow the thread of hatred back to the wound. Just like incels, right? Like go back to that rejection. And like, yeah. like then, then you can be compassionate if you know, like what hurts. Yeah. I think, um, you don't know how to kiss the boo-boo cause you don't know where the boo-boo is. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's hard to place exactly like where it starts. It's more You're of a damn right it is. Yes. Like, it's uh, yeah. like a couple of things come to mind, but I don't know, like, I don't know what the origin is exactly. Yeah. So, but Natalie, that's what you've got to explore. Right. And this is the thing. It doesn't have a origin. So if you get a chance to go back and watch, if I have an, a video about some scars, you should just go back and watch that. But the thing is each of these, so that hurt, it's, that's actually the beautiful answer that makes me more optimistic. So the way, so I think what's, what's going on, this is a some scar. So some scar is a Sanskrit word that means a ball of undigested emotion or an emotional trauma. And essentially what happens is that we carry around this ball of undigested emotion with us and every experience that we have that sort of relates to it grows the size of that emotional trauma. And so when you're saying, I don't know where it starts, the way that you fix it is by going through each of those. The more things that you can think of, conversely, actually, the easier it's going to be to heal because each of those needs to be processed. Sort of with me, I'm going to give you an example in a second. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, if, 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 if we think about, like, let's say I have a phobia of dogs, right? Like, that phobia of dogs starts with one dog biting me. And then what happens if I get bitten again? What happens to my phobia? Is it confirmed? 
confirmed, something. right? Yeah. And then if I get bitten the third time, fourth time, fifth time, the more experiences I can think of of dogs biting me, the greater the emotional trauma is. And so interestingly, if you can think of a handful of things, then you need to go back and talk through each of those. Right? We think like, okay, that first time that dog bit you, it actually didn't bite you. The second time this happened. The third time this happened. And you go back and you process each of those. And then Natalie, you'll feel, it, you'll do it. It's actually, I, I can't, I feel really optimistic for you. Because if you can already think of a bunch of things, that's because each of those things relates to that samskar. Right? Why does your mind think of like, like if I say the word sushi and your mind thinks about six different kinds of sushi, that's because it's all related to that core concept. Mm -hmm. So I'd say if you've done therapy, you know, go through each of those experiences and really think about what hurt about this. Yeah. Where does my anger come from? And track them back and then you'll find this ball of like amorphous, relatively undigested emotion that sprouts and pokes through the ground in several places. But just because you see a lot of different shoots doesn't make your life harder. It actually makes your life easier. Yeah. Well, uh, I can say, yeah, I, I guess, could, could you think you could just describe to me like what it would look like to process like an individual one of these incidents? So, sure. So yeah. give me an example. What's one of the things that you, you thought about? Um, well, okay, this is like, not, not necessarily one of the earliest, but I guess sometime, what was the first six months or seven months of my transition? I can recall like, basically like going into a restaurant and like trying to get a table and having them just like straight up laugh at me and be like, lol, like, this is like, like, this is like a crazy cross dresser. <laughs> like I forget what exactly what they said, but it but it was um you know, so there's that or there's like there's like the time. Well hold on a second. It, oh okay, good, good, good. sorry, keep going, keep going, sorry. Like another time I was walking down uh the street and like early on and like some guy like it was a guy who was following me and Sorry, this is like a little bit explicit, <laughs> but, but he just came up right behind me and said, would you mind if I sucked your dick? <laughs> like, what is the point of that except to make him make, to, to, he wants me to know that he knows that I'm trans and also he wants me to feel degraded about it. Uh, okay. I don't know why he said that. It's a weird thing to say. But <laughs> I completely agree. But, but like, there's a couple of experiences, like, like, a, like a bunch of experiences like that, where it's like, well, people, like, there's sort of people, they want me to know that they know that I'm trans. They don't want me to get away with thinking that, I'm, that people see me as a woman. And they also, like, want me to feel bad about it. And they succeed at that. <laughs> okay. Can I think for a second? Yeah, yeah. So if people are wondering, that's the sum scar. Hmm. So it's this, this whole, okay. So let's just look at something logically for a second, okay? And I'm, I'm going to try to unpack something, but like, it's okay. You don't have to, I'm going to point out logical inconsistencies. I don't want you to defend them because I think that's a sign that we're moving in the right direction. So the guy who walks up to you and says, do you want me to suck your dick? Yeah. And then you say, he wants me to feel dot, 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 dot. And then like, literally yeah. you hypothesize two reasons why he did that. And then yeah. in the, literally in the next sentence, you're like, I have no idea why someone would say that. Yeah, well, I just think it's a weird way of, of getting that, those things across. <laughs> well, well, but so that's the thing is, I don't know where you get the idea of what he was trying to get across. So you may have some insight that I don't have, and I'm, I'm sure you do, right? Because you've been on the receiving end of a lot of these interactions. Yeah. But I think it when you say they don't want me to get away with it, I think yeah. that's like... 
Natalie, do you think you're getting away with it? Getting away with what? You tell me. What were you referring to? Well, I guess... Nice dodge. What, what I feel is that they're trying to do is that they're kind of trying to humiliate me by making sure I know that they are clocking me as, like, a transgender person. You know what I mean? Like, hey, like, no one sees you as, you know, I don't see you as a woman. Like, just so you know. Do like, you see yourself yeah. as a woman, Natalie? Uh, well, I, I kind of go back and forth. I kind of, um... There it is. Yeah. Right? So, like, I don't think... I mean, I could be wrong, right? So you've dealt with more toxicity towards transgender people than I have. Mm -hmm. You know, sucks for you. And so you probably have a better understanding of what's in their head than I do. But yeah. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, you're really, frankly, could be projecting a lot yeah. of their motivations. Because when I ask you, because like, here's, here's the crazy thing, right? That's the fucking sum scar. As you said, they don't want me to get away with it. And I ask you, Natalie, are you a woman? And the way I'm going to interpret your answer is that I really want to be, but I'm not sure that I'm getting away with it. Yeah, I, th I think that, well, so I, I see what you're saying and that I do think that like, if I was like 100% confident, I know who I am. Like, I know that I'm a woman, like nothing anyone else thinks can change that. Then this would not bother me to the extent that it does, right? Precisely. It's the fact that it's picking at what is already an insecurity. Exactly. Right. That's the sum scar. So that's why yeah. when a random person who, you know, who knows what the fuck he was thinking because you know, it sounds like a real perv. But when, yeah. when you can take, and granted, you can assume some things about, you know, what they're thinking. But like, I think generally speaking, like that behavior is so far outside the norm that I would conclude that you can't actually, like your capacity to imagine what that person is thinking is actually quite low. I mean, could be different for you. But, but I think what happens well, is ambigu ambiguous interactions, small interactions, short interactions, like you walking in and they're, them laughing. Like, do you even know that they were laughing at you? I know it sounds like a crazy question. Well, sometimes you're not really sure. But sometimes. But sometimes, sometimes like, it's, they're looking at you in a way that it's like... It seems like that they could be laughing at you for some other reason. But, but like, what else would it be? Exactly. Right. So, so I, I think so yeah. that, that's the thing is I, you, once again, Natalie, I'm hopeful because you're insightful. This is your insecurity. It's not coming from other people. So then the question the now we have to go to the root of it is like, like where, when did you start to think that you wouldn't get away with it? Um, well, I guess, what do we mean by getting away with it? As in like your passing? language. Yeah. So, okay. I, I guess part of what I'm talking about here is like, is like passing as a woman, like having other people see me and, and just pick up. A, okay. That's a woman, you know? Uh, I guess to me, well, especially this, the, the, the perv example, like, cause it's, cause like sometimes people perv on me just the way that they perv on any woman, you know, and that doesn't bother me to the same extent. Cause it's like, cause it's like, well, yeah. I'm cause cause you're passing. That. Right, that's what they do, but like they do that to all to, to to most women or to a lot of women, and so it's like okay, it's not the greatest thing, but it also doesn't really needle me in the same way. But it was the way this guy did it specifically as a reference to the fact that I'm trans. Yeah, you know what I mean. And so it's part part of it, I guess in a way like part of the pain is like it's regardless of the fact that regardless of the, of of, of what he was trying to do, what he said is still revealing that, like, he got me, you know? You yeah. Know? So, so, like, so, but, yeah. but so I, I think that he can only get you if you don't, yeah. if you're hiding something. Yeah. Right? Well, so, yeah. It's true that, like, it, and I think that this is an area where I've made some progress. Like, friend, you made a lot of progress. You're allowed. I'm allowed to be a trans woman. And part of that is I'm allowed to look like a trans woman. Absolutely. Um, and like for, for a while, that seemed like so unacceptable. It was like, no, like if I look like a trans woman, like this is failure. Like this is like equivalent to looking like ugly and unlovable, blah, 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 blah. Like, and so 
<laughs> if you can just hold painful thing. Yeah. 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 That, 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 but I mean, that's, what, that, that's it, Natalie. Yeah. So like, it's like going back in time and like examining those thoughts, the thoughts of, I feel like a failure. Right. So, and I, yeah. I think, I think you're right. You've come a long way, but the, the problem is that like, even though you've learned how to make a really delicious dinner, you still have, you haven't taken out the trash from the failed attempts before. Right. Right. And so I think that there's still a lot there about like what you need to accept yourself as. And, and I, you know, maybe I'm rubbing people the wrong way here, but like, I think you've got to accept yourself as who you are, which is a trans woman, which like, I mean, maybe this is offensive and please let me know if it is. But like, if you are holding yourself up to a beauty standard that involves two X chromosomes. Yeah. That's just like a battle that's going to be hard to win. And even yeah. if you do win it someday, which I hope you do and great for you, you still can't really, it's like just not fair to beat yourself up for like losing all of the attempts until, you know, someone injects you with a virus that replaces your Y chromosome with an X chromosome or something like that. Right. And then you're like, you know, like, like, I mean, you are who you are, right? Yeah. And, and for a long time, and I think that's sort of the antidote to it, but I think you still have to t take out the trash, which is to go back to all those times where you were hunting, right? Mm -hmm. You were expressing yourself. At first, you were hiding a woman in a man's body, and you were hiding it being a man, right? right. And then your girlfriend dumped you because you weren't masculine enough. Right. <laughs> and so, so, like, you've been hiding your entire life, and I think it just goes back to, like, each of those experiences and talking those through. Yeah. Right. Processing them and recognizing that I've been trying to hide who I am for way longer than I'm pretending to be a woman. I don't, I don't mean that offensively, but like you know, I think I'm putting myself in your shoes because I think you sometimes still think that you are pretending to be a woman. Yeah, no, I, I agree that with that, or at least that I'm pretending to be like. I'm, I'm, I'm I sort of I'm getting this great sense of security from the idea that people are just perceiving me as like a biological woman. Yep. Or, you know what I mean? Like the people are not noticing any transness about me. Is it like, this great sense of comfort? And like, I do still have this experience where like, okay, so here's something, something that happens time to time. Like if I meet a new person, like, and they don't know what I do, they don't know anything about me, everything seems to be going well. And then they ask like, oh, like, what's your, like, what's your job? And I'm like, I do internet media. <laughs> they want to know, okay, explicit. I'm like, okay, I'm a YouTuber. And they say, what's your channel about? Oh, you have to tell me so I can Google it right now. And then like, I'll tell them. And then as they Google my name, I will just like, like I can feel my face get like hot with the shame of knowing that they, what they're about to find out. Yeah. So that's coming from you, friend. Yeah. It's not coming, I mean, as much as those toxic assholes on the internet think that they have power over you, like, I just don't think, I mean, sure, they can hurt you, don't get me wrong. But, like, that's the shame that is, like, it's the anticipatory shame of them knowing. Yeah. Right? And you're right, because it's security. But, like, this is, this. it goes back to courage, Natalie. Yeah. Security is about, like, hiding from them something about yourself. Because you're afraid, like, why is that secure for you? Because you're afraid of what they'll see and how they'll react. And like, yeah. why is that? And, and like, that's because it goes, I think that goes back to like how you used to react. Yeah. What you see that's in them is like, yeah. And, and so I think it's like, it's, like, I mean, I don't know how to say this, but it's all this crap. Like we can't, unfortunately, we can't do it all today. But I think these yeah. are the threads you've got to run down, right? Like your own toxicity towards other people, the way that you used to judge them, because that's the way you judge yourself. Yes. It's, it's about like learning that you're going to be a trans woman for the rest of your life. Yes. And I, I don't... Yeah, yeah, no, that's like, that's something that I recently have like, it's kind of, because I'm, you know, I'm a, what, like almost three and a half, something like that, years into medical and social transition. And like, I, I, I'm at a point where I sort of dispelled this illusion, I guess, from earlier on. Earlier on, it, it, there's, there's almost a delusion that takes hold. It's like, oh, I'm going to get to the end of this and I'm just going to be a cis woman. But it's like, no, I'm not. Like, so, I'm kind of at the, yeah. So, so here's, here's the problem 
right? So like, I'm not an expert in political theory or sociology. If I say something that's offensive, I apologize. Here's what I see as a problem, and you're welcome to think I'm wrong. If you don't accept yourself as a trans woman, you are placing a value on cis women over trans women. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Right. And so that's, I think, the basic problem is that, like, you are valuing something above yourself that you will never be. Yeah, and impossible. And then you're confused why, despite your material success, you are unhappy. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, yeah. And, and so, like, Natalie, like, it, it comes to, like, accepting who you are and accepting that, you know, like, there are a lot of parts of you that are ugly and you hate yourself and whatever, but like, I think you've got to go back and, and just, I mean, that's the thing until you accept yourself for who you are. Right. And you can still like want to be more feminine, but once again, it's like, that has to come from you. And that has to come from like forward momentum. It's like, you're like the person who wants to lose 50 pounds and has lost 30 pounds and you're beating yourself up because you still need to lose 20 more. Like it's going to be a journey. Yeah. And I don't think, at least in this life, you're ever going to be a cis woman. We'll see. But the thing is, I don't think that there's a problem with that. Yeah. Right? I think it's like, if you think there's a problem with that, that's on you. But if you think it's a problem with it, that's not something that's ever going to, I mean, maybe medical, like, who knows? Right? We well, I feel that it's like, I feel that it's something I sort of just, I mean, there are trans women who kind of say like, oh, I'm not even trans anymore. I've had all the surgeries, like, blah, blah, blah. Like, but I don't, I think that I don't quite agree with that. I think that like, there's no erasing who, where you come from. And I guess, I guess but I- Boy, I Natalie, that, do you try? Yeah, well, sure. I do. <laughs> Especially, I mean, like not all the time. I don't try all the time. Yeah. And I'm like aware that online, like, and like, like oh, come on, the, the game is up. People know that I'm trans. Like, but, <laughs> but it's true that, that like offline, I do try to keep people from knowing okay. a lot of the time. And yeah, like, so, yeah, go for it. Sorry. And I guess on some level, I, I, there's also a regret, regret almost at the time on the internet. It's like, well, I might have had a, had a chance to just kind of blend in and just not have to deal with any of this if I hadn't made this so public. Yeah. So the regret is once again about the security. It's about the mask. Your regret yeah. is that like you let people know who you are. Yeah. If your regret would have won, you would be living a life that is inauthentic and you'd be happy and uh, unhappy anyway. That's true. Yeah. It's hard to really, but like, you've got to just swim in that shit. Yeah. Well, I know like with some trans people, like, they, like they call, it's called on um, like, we call it like living stealth, which is when you're living, uh, you're not out as, as trans to the people around you. People just think that, you know, if you're trans woman, people just think you're a woman. They don't know about your trans history. Um, so I think part of the, I think, because I've heard from a lot of people who live that way, that it actually kind of eats away at them in its own way, because they're keeping this major part of them out with yeah. other people. I, I think part of my issue is that I never have lived like stealth, except in these like little isolated incidents where I'm like, I'm enjoying the fact that I've just met this person and they don't seem to know yet, you know? Um, but like, I, I think that because I don't have that experience of living as stealth, I guess I feel like, I don't know, I wish I had like at least more of that. And maybe if I did have more of that, then I would realize that it's not that great and I wouldn't care, you know? So Natalie, I, I, you know, this may be, I don't even know what the statement is going to do. I didn't realize you were a trans woman when I watched your YouTube video. I don't know yeah. how that's going to affect you. Like, how does that make you feel if I tell you that? I love it. <laughs> I know I'm not supposed. I know I'm not supposed to love it, but it makes me feel really good. Okay, so so forget about what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Like why? Like I'm telling you, to, to you know, so you can look at yourself, and like yeah. what feels satisfied. Well, it feels like. Um, I guess it, it. It feels like you saw me the way I, I kind of want to be seen. Okay. And now I know you're a trans woman. Yeah. How do you feel? Uh, I mean, I mean, it's fine. <laughs> Most people know, but like, but I guess it's, um, it does, I feel ch change a little bit. I, I feel like it must change. What's changed? It must change how you see me somewhat. 
look at my face. What do you see? What do I think about you? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Try. I mean, you invited me on your show. <laughs> Sure. So couldn't hate me that much. But, but I, I didn't know you were trans when we invited you on our show. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess... Natalie, look at my face and tell me what, you, what I think about you. What do you see in my face? Um, well, I, I, think, I think you're interested and, and you care what I have to say. Okay, good. Both true. Anything else? Yeah. Um, I mean, okay. You don't seem like you don't. You don't seem to be disgusted. <laughs> what do you think about that? Um, that it's nice. <laughs> yeah. So when you say something must have changed, what must have changed? Well, I guess it comes from this fear that, like. If people know that I'm trans, they're gonna like recategorize me as like, okay, probably like, I don't know, some kind of like abnormal deviant instead of just, <laughs> and which I don't know, like, why, why do I care so much about people who think I'm an abnormal deviant? I am an abnormal deviant. Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, well, you care this, so like, much because, because like it yeah. comes from you, man. Yeah. And hopefully that's not offensive. <laughs> I just don't know. I just don't know. Like, I don't know. I honestly don't understand why I have this like conformist streak that comes out about this particular issue when a lot of other ways I'm not really that conformist. Yeah. So like, like here's the thing, Natalie, you are a complicated bundle of all kinds of shit. Some of yeah. it good and some of it bad. And I accept all of it. Hmm. Whatever. There's a part of you that's a toxic asshole, fine. There's a part of you yeah. that's brilliant and a good teacher, fine. There's a part of you that's a trans woman, fine. There's a part of you that's just a woman without cis, without trans, without anything else, fine. But you're you. Yeah. And like every part of you that I've seen, I think is great. Right? Like you're just you. And like you keep on doing you and don't worry about like you know, like, like, cause when I tell you, like, when we explore my understanding of whether you're trans or not, it like, it comes from your head because you've been talking to me the whole time. I've known you're trans uh, sort of the whole time. Right. But it's like, even when I share with you, like, so you've had a particular impression of me, but when we start talking about my beliefs about whether you're trans or not, this whole other complex arises in your mind. Do you see that? Yeah. Whereas well, we've been talking for like two hours and like, I mean, I don't know if it's been there or not, but I haven't noticed it until now, which is like, it's just weird. It's a whole separate thing. I mean, it's like my preoccupation with like how you're seeing me or how yes. you're- Yes, yes. Yeah. Right? And yeah. I, I turned that switch on by telling you I didn't know you were trans. Yes. Whereas we've just been two humans talking about- shit for the last two hours and like it's been fun for me hopefully it's been fun for you yeah and then all i have to do is i have to tell you i didn't know you were trans because i really i i don't know and then as soon as that like a switch turns on in your mind and this whole complex opens up but like that's just like some weird psychological conditioning or a some scar it's not anything to do with reality does that yeah. make sense yeah I, I mean no it does i think i think that this this question of like whether I'm being perceived as trans or whether I'm being perceived as a woman or what I'm how I'm being perceived is like I mean it's maybe not as bad as it used to be but for so there was a, there was years where this was a, just a constant preoccupation and so it's very easy to like re-enter that state of mind. You're damn right like, it is. Yeah, that is yeah. the sum scar. So each of those moments that you remember, right? You got to talk those through with someone. And I don't know if you. I don't know how much emotional processing you've done since you asked me, how do I do that? But I suspect a little bit. So your tools are going to be like going back, thinking through that, trying to talk to yourself like your older sister. You may evoke compassion, maybe like a shortcut to find, you know, what you needed to tell yourself and how to practice self-compassion, which I think everyone can do. Like one tool is just pretend that you're the older version of yourself. And, I mean, yeah. you know, and just going back in time. And the third thing, and I, I, I kid you not, Natalie, is just noticing is enough to transform. 
this is the biggest like mis misunderstanding of the largely Western world is that we think that doing something enacts change. Whereas the yogis in the East say awareness of something is sufficient to change it. Hmm. And so I'd say just notice these thoughts. Notice, notice, notice. And when you explore, why do we say explore? Why do we say emotionally process? We are bringing things up from your mind for you to notice. And that is what emotional processing is. It's kind of really bizarre, but like, you know, if you tell someone, hey, you know, I just lost a loved one and that person says to you, hey, I'm sorry, that sucks. Is that person alive? Now no. <laughs> that they express, but like, the, but why do you feel better? They didn't do anything, right? All they did is acknowledge yeah, they you're noticed fine. your hurt. And that yeah. in and of itself is sufficient to reduce it. It's crazy. But that's how it works. So that's my recommendation to you. Well, I think that's maybe kind of part of the hope and part of the motivation for making the like the more personal videos that I do is like this this feeling that like, oh, if I can share, if I can make up the other people see the pain that I'm in, that will be some it will some in some way relieve part of it. Yeah, so I, I makes sense to me, but I think this goes back to something you said at the very beginning of the interview, which is that you're a confession mm -hmm. junkie. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I, I don't think it's about sharing with the rest of the world. I think it's the reason that feels good. Like why does confession is because you're noticing it, right? Like you're accepting it. You're bringing it to the surface. You're not hiding it. You're not masking it. You're not stealthing anything. Mm -hmm. You're just being with it. And then mm -hmm. it gets easier, which is like, I think anthropologically, like probably one of the reasons that if you look at like a you know, how confession and things like that evolved, that probably has something to do with that. Mm -hmm. Questions? Well, I know, like, um, I guess a lot of teenagers are, are kind of like bullies and then come to like later regret or feel horrible about having been bullies. Like, I've talked to a lot of people like that. Like, they look back on their teenagers and they say, like, oh, I was awful to people. But it came from this space of, like, of being hurt themselves and kind of, I don't know, preferring to like be on the side of the person doing the hurting or something for once. Um, I guess. Sorry, I forgot where I was going with this. <laughs> what was the question you asked me? Huh? What was the question? What was the question you asked me? I just said, do you have any questions? Oh, I guess. Um, I guess I feel like the one thing I haven't mentioned that related to any of this stuff is that I do feel that like in a lot of subtle ways that these problems have like been behind some of the like uglier moments in the time that I've been online. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I don't know how aware of this you are, but like a lot of the, like I'm like a fairly controversial person within trans spaces. Okay. Because of like a lot of people are upset about some like borderline transphobic things that I've said in the past, and it's I I sort of I I I know that the, those the things that I said that that are are contra like I didn't say anything too horrible, but like it's something that like people kind of pick up on because in a sense when they say that I'm transphobic that they're right like. Like, I feel like they're, exa they're, exa they're exaggerating. Often they, they say it in a really mean way where they're trying to vilify me. But, like, they're, they, they, like, they see the same thing that you're seeing, you know? And I feel that, and I feel that on some level they're right, that it has, like, come out in these ways that are sometimes ugly. And I guess I just don't, I, I guess my final thought is, like, I wonder if there's any way to kind of, like, undo some of the damage of that. Sure. Of course. So, so I, I know it sounds like a simple answer to what sounds like a heavy question, but yeah. absolutely not. So I think it starts with what I'm hearing is that there's a little bully in you that sometimes is a little bit bullying towards trans people, which we know yeah. because you bully the shit out of yourself all the time. Right. <laughs> and, and, and that it peaks out and then some people from the trans community blame you for it. Yeah. 
which I don't think you're transphobic in the way that there's like true transphobic people, but I'm not surprised that there are people who are attuned towards some of your negative attitudes that fluctuate and peak out in your content. I think yeah, it's not it's actually it's fair or compassionate for them to like zero in on those moments in the larger scheme of your overall thread, right? Mm -hmm. I tend to be a pretty compassionate guy. Sometimes I can be a dick. And I think it's fair for people to sniff that out. And yeah. like, I'd also appreciate it if they could, you know, look at the scope of my things and judge me for all of it. That's what now, I want too, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, but that's sort of on them. And you ask, can I heal from it? And I think absolutely. And I think this goes back to what we're talking about, which is that you've got to start with yourself, right? You've got to start with like stopping the bullying towards yourself. And this yeah. is the crazy thing that, as you kind of alluded to, is that a lot of bullies are bullies because they're hurting in some way. Like if you look mm -hmm. at kids that are behavioral and like hit other kids, it's oftentimes because they were abused. And you kind of mentioned, you've alluded to this, but it's something that I call the cycle of abuse. And it's like the cycle of abuse continues. Like we see it in like medical training where, you know, you get yelled at in the operating room by a surgeon because, I mean, it's like my second day and some guy's yelling at me because I don't know how to do surgery. I'm like, dude, if I don't know how to do anything in this room, it's fucking your fault. Like it's not, I mean, yeah. you're the person who's been doing surgery. This is my second day, bro. And, and so, so we do that, right? Like we learn a particular way of like interacting and then we adopt those patterns and we propagate them. So if you want to make the world a better place and you want to heal the hurt that you've caused, and I don't doubt that you've caused hurt and that's not because you're a bad person, it's because we all cause hurt. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we're new at this thing called life. Yeah. Can you fix it? I mean, can you fix those particular things? No, I, maybe not. But I don't think that's relevant. I think you've got to start by like trying to make the world a better place. That I think you can absolutely do. Start by yeah. understanding why you bully yourself. That to track that back to your hurt. Mm -hmm. Compassion towards that hurt will make the bullying behavior go away. And mm -hmm. once you become that person, I have no doubt in my mind that you will be a force for overall net good in the world if you aren't already. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think you should do. And that, my friend, is your karma. This is your journey. And you've been given these challenges. You've walked this path. You've learned how to stumble. You've learned how to fall. And then you will be in a different kind of place. Because right now, bullying yourself in the trans community is transphobic and no one is going to do it. But I would venture that a lot of people are doing exactly what you do. But the problem yeah. is it's so fucking transphobic, no one's allowed to talk about it, so no one can ever help each other with it. No one ever, yeah. can ever be compassionate towards it. Well, that is the problem, is that because on the one hand, it's either other people who are like very transphobic will take your side, and then the people who are hurt by what you're saying vilify you for it. So it's so, like the only compassion that is, is, is had for you is, well, there's no compassion for you, right? It's either taking so, your side in, a, in, a, in an evil way. Well, it's not an evil, it's like evil, but like in a, in a somewhat like in a mean way, a malicious yeah. way. Yeah. So, or so there's yeah. like, you know, they're, they're seeing you as this villain. So, Natalie, this is what I think you need to do. You need to help yourself first and foremost. And then what you need to do is shine out towards the rest of the world. Yeah. Right? Like once you become like pure and clean and you accept yourself who you are, just let broadcast that shit out there. And some people are going to get pissed at you and some people are going to glom on and some people are going to twist your words. But it's been my overwhelming experience that when you just try to work on yourself and you become a decent human being and you just let the rest of the world see, it tends to work out pretty well. Yeah. So start by fixing the hurt within yourself and then you can talk about being transphobic or bullying yourself or the hateful thoughts. And if you use those words, right? If you use, if you say like, I used to like look at myself in the mirror and like I'm ashamed of who I see, there is no doubt in my mind that like, you know, lots of trans people out there are gonna resonate with that. And then when yeah. you say, this is how I learned how to be different, a lot of people are gonna resonate with that. And then they're gonna stop bullying themselves and then you will be a, a force for good in the world and you will have healed the hurt. Sound good? That sounds very good. <laughs> okay. This is very helpful. I'm glad because I never know where this is going to go. No, this is going very well. Okay.
I'm glad. I, 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 need, I need someone to tell me these things every day. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so who can that be? Um, there's a couple of people in my life who, like... Incorrect. I th- I th- okay. Who is so going to tell you... I have to tell myself. Is that what you're you're damn right. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Because here's the crazy thing. What do you tell yourself every day? Uh, what do I tell myself every day? Yeah, right? <sighs> that sigh says it all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you're it's, right. It's... You absolutely need, you need to hear these things every day. Yeah. You're damn right. You and everyone else who's insecure or struggles with something, you need to hear this every fucking day. And there, it's wonderful that you have people in your life. I encourage you to recruit them. But once again, it depends on which side you're on. Are you on their team, Natalie? Or are you on the toxic team? Yeah. Work on it. I have faith in you. You've come this right. far. And I think that like it's hard to come this far without you know, having a lot of courage, a lot of resilience, brilliance, frankly. Thanks. <laughs> I just try. Yeah. Cool. So I, right, I'm kind of done. Are you okay, okay with yeah, wrapping up? I, I'm, no, I'm, I'm good. That's, that okay. sounds, sounds great to me. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in terms of meditation, sometimes I'll teach a formal practice. But it, in this case, Natalie, I really encourage you to, like, watch what comes up. So, like, go and look at a picture of yourself and, like, watch what comes up. And even, yeah. like, like, just watch those thoughts and those feelings and then, like, try to be your older sister. And that's going to take practice. Yeah. You know, if you feel ashamed of yourself, just look at yourself in the mirror and see what comes up. See what you tell yourself. Right? And then try to... Yeah. It would be good to do, to be able to do that, because I feel like then I could also be an older sister to other trans people, which is something that I sort of have not quite gotten to be able to do. Yeah, because you haven't been ready yet. Yeah. So that's your karma. Right. So like, it'd be interesting because I think from like a karmic perspective that if you wanted to be an older sister to lots of trans people, I would recommend a career like a PhD in philosophy where you're doing research in in an academic setting. Mm -hmm. As opposed to having a YouTube channel with a million subscribers where you have a platform (laughs) where you can communicate a message of positivity towards people who need to hear it. Which one would you pick? Well, I suppose at this point... (laughs) The decision has been made. I don't know. Damn right. I feel, yeah, I feel like I think this can be done either way. Yep. And I think that's your karma, right? Because, yeah. oh, lo and behold, you happen to have a platform where you get 3 million views yeah. for videos that you make. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of... Um, well, it's, it's, it frightens me, actually, the amount of responsibility that comes with that. Good. That is the best feeling that you've had all the time today. You should be terrified. <laughs> yes, terrifying. <laughs> because Natalie, you have a big burden on your shoulders. Yeah. And the world needs you. Yeah. And so time to, you know, start treating yourself well, get fully aligned with who you are as a person, because there are lots of trans women and trans men and cis women and cis men who are insecure about what they see and need something from you. And it turns out that you're an incredibly thoughtful person who can tell a very succinct story with lots of context and background, and you have a training in philosophy and argument. So if you have something to say, turns out that you're actually pretty skilled at saying it and helping people understand. So if you feel the crushing weight of responsibility on your shoulders, I'd say good job. Grow the fuck up and get to work. (laughs) Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. This has been... uh... This one was a little more interesting than I imagined it was going to be. <laughs> For me too. I didn't even know you were a trans woman. I didn't know you did. Gonna... <laughs> but hey, oh, so Natalie, it's been delightful. Wow. It's been great. Yeah, it's, it's been good. <laughs> so you guys just, you want to just tell people who are here a little bit later, a little bit about what you do and where we can find you? Uh, yeah. Um, so my name is ContraPoints. This is the name of the channel, C-O-N-T-R-A points and uh yeah twitter youtube instagram i'd focus on youtube the other stuff you know yeah 
So she Something makes really cool up. videos that are like really well thought out um, and, and kind of start to finish. I think it's like really good. It's not just some like snippet. It's like really well thought out. So check out ContraPoints. Thanks for coming on and good luck to you, friend. Thank you so much. All right, bye. That was different from what I was expecting. But uh, yeah, that was great. Man, she is awesome.